Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The EU has doubled down on its threat to take action against the UK after talks about the implementation of post-Brexit trading arrangements in Northern Ireland ended without a breakthrough today. At the heart of the row is the Brexit Agreement's Northern Ireland Protocol, which allows for border checks on goods going into the province from the rest of the UK. Ministers want an end to those checks, arguing they are leading to food shortages. The European Commission's Vice President, Maros Sefcovic, warned that the EU is ready to take what he called resolute action if the UK failed to meet its obligations. In the last hour, Boris Johnson insisted a deal was still doable. Our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, reports. A short, powerful slogan, but getting Brexit done isn't as easy as it sounds. After years of painstaking negotiations, we left the EU with a deal. Now the whole thing could be unravelling over those new rules on trade in Northern Ireland. The EU's chief negotiator was back in London for more talks with the UK's Brexit minister, and it didn't go well. We are at the crossroads in our relationship with the UK. The EU will not be shy in reacting swiftly, firmly and resolutely to ensure that the UK abides by its international law obligations. There weren't any breakthroughs, there aren't any breakdowns either, and we're going to carry on talking. What we really now need to do is very urgently find some solutions. The most severe Brexit disruption is being felt in Northern Ireland, which still follows EU rules. England, Scotland and Wales don't, so the way goods move within the UK has changed. For example, the EU doesn't accept chilled meats from other countries, so British sausages won't be allowed in Belfast supermarkets from the end of this month. Certain things like milk, eggs, medicine and parcels need to be monitored when they arrive in Northern Ireland from Great Britain to make sure they meet EU standards. That's because Northern Ireland shares an open land border with an EU member, Ireland and the EU doesn't want unchecked products finding their way into its single market area. This row's been brewing since the UK decided without agreement to delay some of these checks. You've already launched legal action. How soon would you consider starting the next step? I, I was coming here with a hope uh, uh, for, a, for, a, for a breakthrough. Of course, now we have to consider our future steps. It's not too late. Let's correct uh, the path. Let's, uh, let's focus on uh, what unites us. There were plenty of people warning Boris Johnson at the time that the deal he was signing up to would mean exactly this, more checks and restrictions on goods crossing the Irish border. But ministers now sound irritated and surprised that the EU expects the UK to stick to the rules it agreed to. If that doesn't happen, there won't just be legal action, the EU could retaliate with taxes on British exports. Boris Johnson's in Cornwall preparing for the G7 summit of world leaders. He says the Brexit deal is about the careful balance of relationships. What we want to do is make sure that we can uh, have a solution that guarantees the, the peace process, it protects the peace process, uh, but also guarantees the, the economic and territorial integrity of, of the whole United Kingdom. The Prime Minister faces some uncomfortable chats beside the sea as the practical realities of Brexit become clearer. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. The EU sounded tonight as if it was threatening Britain with a trade war after talks over Northern Ireland broke down without agreement. The European Commission spokesman said the EU had not ruled out what he called cross-retaliation unless the UK abides by the protocol it signed up to. Britain wants to delay imposing checks on some goods, including sausages, going into Northern Ireland. More from our political correspondent, Romilly Weeks. Connecting Europe boasts the ferries in and out of Belfast, but the UK's relations with Europe are still facing a big disconnect. And Northern Ireland is the battleground once again, with the rhetoric heating up over sausages. There were no bangers on the menu at the UK-EU talks today, as they tried and failed to come up with a compromise that would allow chilled meats to be imported into Northern Ireland from next month, alongside plenty of other problems.
the protocol is being implemented in a way which is causing disruption in Northern Ireland. And we had some pretty frank and honest discussions about that situation today. There weren't any breakthroughs. There aren't any breakdowns either. And we're going to carry on talking. So what's going wrong? It's all about what's known as the Northern Ireland Protocol. After Brexit, both the EU and UK agreed the need to avoid checks on the Irish border. But that meant Northern Ireland had to continue to follow EU rules on food standards, moving checks on goods crossing the Irish Sea instead. Without some compromise, sausages and other chilled meats will not be allowed from GB to Northern Ireland from next month. Checks on other supermarket goods, medicines and even pets arriving in Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK are also proving problematic. The EU is threatening cross-retaliation, i.e. a trade war could be next if the UK continues to refuse to implement the checks it signed up to in the Brexit agreement. Our patience uh, really is... Uh wearing very, very thin, and uh, therefore we have to assess uh, all options uh, uh, we have uh, at our disposal. I was talking about the, the, the legal action, uh, I was talking about the arbitration, and of course I'm talking about the cross-retaliation. Uh, the standoff is having real consequences in Northern Ireland, renewed political instability and an impact on business and consumers. And we're really talking about the worst-case scenario of having cost rises, and having availability issues that we won't be able to keep the same things on the shelves as there are now. Into all this flies the US president today. He's already made it clear protecting the peace in Northern Ireland is a priority. A tricky time for the UK, who won't want problems with neighbours to spoil G7 talks with old friends. Romilly Weeks, ITV News. Well, our political correspondent Libby Vina is in Cornwall tonight where the G7 meeting will be taking place. Libby, lots on the agenda for the next few days, but has uh, the EU row overshadowed things somewhat? Yes, well, this is a landmark summit, the first time since the start of the pandemic that leaders of the Western world have met in person. And the Prime Minister, of course, would like to focus on issues such as vaccinating the rest of the world by the end of next year, planning for future pandemics and climate change. But unfortunately, it does look as though the summit will be overshadowed because it doesn't seem at the moment that we're getting very good at getting on with our nearest neighbours. Three of the key players in the G7, of course, are France, Germany and Italy. And add to that that we have a new president in the White House, President Biden, who looks like he might be a much more interventionist president. I think uh, the Prime Minister will have his work cut out if this meeting isn't to end up being dubbed the Sausage Summit. All right, Livy, thank you. The EU and the UK remain at loggerheads over the UK government's threat to delay checks on chilled meats being imported from the mainland to Northern Ireland. The EU says any grace period allowed while the post-Brexit system bedded in is now over and it's time to stick to the rules of the Brexit deal. The UK says the EU should be more pragmatic. After talks ended today without compromise, the EU said their patience was wearing very, very thin. Our business and global trade correspondent, Paul McNamara, reports. 8 a.m. eye to eye for a Brexit breakfast time meeting and one thing on the menu. <laughs> Wicks Manor make gourmet sausages and lots of them, 20,000 every single day. But come July 1st, a grace period for the Northern Ireland Protocol ends and butchers in Belfast and elsewhere become a no-go zone for sausages or chilled meat products made in Great Britain. Rules which aren't going down well with farmers. Whether you're a Scottish potato farmer trying to get seed potatoes into Northern Ireland or whether you're a processor of fresh meat, it's madness that we can't supply one part of the United Kingdom with another part of the United Kingdom. And we've got to override, overrule these protocols. Boris is on the right lines. He needs to flood Northern Ireland with British sausage and make the EU choke on them. Enter the EU's Brexit chief, Maris Sefcovic. Fresh from talks, hope to resolve this issue. How did they go? Trust which should be at the heart of every partnership, needs to be restored. And then a warning. If the UK were to take further unilateral action over the coming weeks, the EU will not be shy in reacting swiftly, firmly and resolutely to ensure that the UK abides by its international law obligations. Those swift sanctions could include legal action, he explained, or retaliatory trade measures such as tariffs. 
Under Brexit, chilled meat products like sausages and mints have been banned from entering the EU since the 1st of January, while the Northern Ireland Protocol puts an EU bureaucratic border for goods travelling between Great Britain and Northern Ireland in the Irish Sea. A six-month grace period was agreed to allow those products like sausages and chicken nuggets into Northern Ireland from Britain. But as of July 1st, that ends and British fresh sausage exports to Northern Ireland would be banned. Just one flashpoint in a number of obstacles presented by the protocol. The government says the protocol has thrown up more issues than they foresaw and are looking for creative solutions. Be that as it may, says the EU, it's a protocol the UK negotiated and agreed to. I mean, how do you expect the EU to do business with you when you go back on your word like this? So this, the situation in Northern Ireland is a sensitive uh, one and the protocol is, is delicately balanced to support it. We don't see what risk is caused to Northern Ireland if chilled meats are imported there from GB. But will you allow those exports to continue regardless of what the EU says? So as uh, we continue to, con to consider all our options on that and other issues. What we want is something that uh, enables us to protect uh, trade flows uh, east-west as well as, uh, as, well as north-south, and I'm, that's easily doable. I'm very, very optimistic about this. The language used by the UK and the EU is still couched in diplomatic terms, both sides eager to find a solution. But behind closed doors, an EU source tells us they left this morning's meeting with Lord Frost bitterly disappointed and angry. This may be a new round of talks, they said, but the UK brought nothing substantively new to the table. And something new is needed to stop any more scenes like this. Sectarian violence on the streets of Belfast in April, fueled by the prospect of Northern Ireland being treated differently to the rest of the UK. Are you really willing to put peace in Northern Ireland at risk over the checks on meat? EU is a peace project, and peace for us is of, uh, as I said, uh, paramount importance, and we have absolute commitment. Uh, uh, we have absolute commitment to peace. Therefore, we went the unprecedented great length uh, to agree uh, that the, the checks will be done by the UK authorities uh, in the Northern Ireland. The business community in Northern Ireland says politics is getting in the way of pragmatism. They want and need solutions quick. They've got to decide between them in a pragmatic way what is going into Northern Ireland versus what is going through Northern Ireland. What we'd say is sit back down and make it work. That's your jobs. With three weeks to go until the grace period ends and a history of deals being struck at the last minute, these negotiations may linger. In the meantime, the old saying about sausages is equally applicable to Brexit deals. Rarely do you want to find out how they're made. Well, our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is in Cornwall ahead of the G7 summit. Gary. This is extraordinary timing, this spat. Here is Britain in Cornwall trying to showcase post-Brexit Britain, global Britain, trusted international player, showcasing it here just as this spat fires up. And uh, you can uh, imagine the horror of President Biden on his uh, flight on his way over here, his first overseas uh, uh, mission out of the United States since he became uh, president. He's over here uh, to try and show how demo democratic countries can work together. And here are these uh, two sides squabbling. I say two sides because one of the interesting things about the numbers in the room is that the G7 includes uh, three uh, EU national leaders. There are actually two other heavies from the uh, EU in the uh, room as well for the entire uh, summit, the European Council President and the uh, European Commission President. Uh, and those people clearly don't trust uh, Boris Johnson in, uh, on the way he is handling Brexit. Uh, the UK is, for its part, saying that the EU is being prissy, legalistic and in danger of upsetting certain elements of the unionist uh, population uh, in Northern Ireland uh, and inciting violence because of that. Uh, one other interesting thing that's emerging uh, out of uh, chats with people uh, in uh, the EU capitals is a consensus that has formed that Boris Johnson uh, didn't pull the plug on these talks today, didn't unilaterally uh, tear up elements of the agreement as the EU would see it, but they think 
when it's wheels up for Air Force One leaving Britain and leaving Europe, he's got another phase to this mission uh, while he's uh, over here, they are saying it is probable, not possible, but probable, they think, that then Boris Johnson will actually properly rip up the agreement soon after uh, those wheels are up. And that is their current thinking. That is the atmosphere of squabbling that President Biden is walking into as he tries to uh, get people talking about democratic country cooperation on COVID, on China and on climate change. Thanks, Gary. Well, joining me now is Stephen Kelly, who's chief executive of Manufacturing Northern Ireland. He shared a video in 2019, which is now famous, when Boris Johnson assured a group of Northern Ireland Conservatives that everything would work in NI post-Brexit. Absolutely not that. And if somebody asked you to do that, tell them to ring up the Prime Minister and I will direct them to throw that form in the bin. Well, Stephen Kelly, I mean, what do you make of Boris Johnson's promises from that night? Um, I think your mic, your mic might be muted. Can you try unmuting yourself? To be fair to the Prime Minister, the, uh, the promise there was about goods travelling from Northern Ireland into the rest of the UK, and that has been delivered. We have unfettered access into the UK market. The challenge that we have here is that there are goods going in the opposite direction uh, from Great Britain into Northern yeah. Ireland. I, I mean, that, that was that a promise he also access. made after that night. He was asked specifically that, about that, yeah. That, that's correct. He asked. Uh, he did give commitments uh, that come in the opposite direction as well. And I can tell you, Christian, that uh, our businesses are still saying that goods travelling from Northern Ireland to GB unfettered is fine. But the friction that's been created on the Irish Sea in the opposite direction, particularly where Britain is used as a place for warehousing and for distribution, is causing very significant strain onto not only business but civic life here in Northern Ireland. And so, well, I mean, when you hear you know, Gary Gibbon saying, look, Boris Johnson might tear up the agreement, what do you think? What would that mean? Well, I mean, a lot of the narrative today is around uh, sausages travelling to Northern Ireland. And what I can say is that the one thing that will stop the British banger arriving in Northern Ireland quickest will be legal uncertainty. So if, if this is a solution that may be potentially proposed uh, to allow that sausage to continue to travel, then it's going to absolutely fail on arrival. Uh, what we need is both sides to get over the tug of war around Northern Ireland. Uh, we're feeling very much like the rope at the moment. And the sad thing about a rope and a tug of war battle is that eventually it may snap. Uh, and what we need is pragmatic solutions. We need action really, really quickly. And we need action from both sides because both have the opportunity here to stretch themselves a little bit further, to make the protocol work, to settle down and decompress the politics in Northern Ireland and let business get on with what it does best, which is moving goods and selling those at markets at home and abroad. But do you, do you accept that what the deal did sign Britain up for was some checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and that those checks will need to be brought in? We do, and we're absolutely uh, operating those at the moment. I can tell you now that uh, there isn't a manufacturer, in fact, there isn't a business in Northern Ireland that isn't feeling the implications of those checks. It is uh, friction that is unwelcome, but it's friction that we've accepted. Business gets on with uh, the business of business. Uh, but what we do need is those checks to be simplified, the cost of that to be removed. But more particularly, we need political stability here in Northern Ireland. And we need certainty in terms of the long term so that we can ensure that our people are well paid and that Northern Ireland can prosper. And do you fear for the peace? I don't think you uh, need to look too far back in the last number of months to see how things can quite quickly escalate in a place like Northern Ireland. We're coming into a very difficult summer period. It's always been difficult. Uh, and I think that the politics around what's happening at the moment certainly are poisoning uh, the relationships on the streets and here in Northern Ireland. So we need both sides to really understand the implications of what's going on in the, in the last number of days uh, to get back around the table before the end of this month and agree some pragmatic solutions that will decompress the politics. Stephen Kelly, thank you very much indeed. Well, joining me now is Philip Rycroft, who was Permanent Secretary for the Department for Exiting the EU from 2017 until 2019. Philip Rycroft, what do you think is going on here? Well, we have a difficult problem, don't we? Uh, there has been a draining of trust from this exercise. It's never really got into a rhythm where the two sides can sort out the evident issues around handling the border. And until that trust is restored, it's difficult to see 
how we're going to find a solution to what is a really, really tough problem and, and a very dangerous problem. The Prime Minister and Lord Frost have been saying, well, I mean, much of this was unforeseen. Was it unforeseen in government, really? I, 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 the, the deal that was, uh, that was signed around the Northern Ireland Protocol, the UK government would have had a very good understanding of the implications of that. We, you know, the work I did in, in government uh, with, the, with the great team that I had there, we knew what the implications of a border with the EU uh, would be, and particularly for agri-food products, uh, and of course that applies to anywhere where there's a border between the UK and the EU, uh, but by extension that applies to the border between GB and Northern Ireland if that's where the checks were going to take place. There is an issue of course around the supermarket lorries where you have hundreds of products in one load which complicates the situation. Uh, but this is a simple question of maths. If you've got one load, it's one form. If you've got hundreds of products on a load, it means hundreds of forms. So all of this um, uh, was predictable, and I think it's disingenuous to suggest otherwise. And is the UK currently not doing what it signed up to do? Well, I, the, the detail of that, of course, is there's two in frame between the Commission and the UK government, um, and the UK government saying we're doing our best and the EU, EU Commission saying you're not doing enough and they seem to have been slow on building the border inspection posts, slow on opening up the systems, the custom systems so the EU side can see what's going on. The UK saying actually we've, you know, we've put in place four new IT systems and all the rest of it. And um, the, the truth of the matter, I suspect, is the UK has not moved as fast as the European Commission would have wished and has not moved as fast as is required uh, to get this thing working on the ground. Hence already that we've seen the unilateral extension of grace periods and the risk of another unilateral extension coming up uh, in a few weeks time. A lot of casual observers might say, look at The world stage is set on a Cornish beach. The sun is out, the big guns have arrived. Just one problem for the PM, however, is they may currently appear aimed at him. Tonight reports that the American president, on his first trip outside the US, has made plain his unease about the Prime Minister's position on that Northern Ireland protocol. Any breaches, he's warned, are of grave concern. Now, to some, those breaches are about sausages. To others, they're about trust. The UK wants to know why it can't export its own meat within its own sovereign territory. The EU tells Britain knows the answer already. The formal protocol both sides signed into law after the backstop was rejected and Brexit left few other options. So can the two sides work it out? Can America find a solution if they can't? And what happens to our trade if nothing is resolved? Nick Watt is here. Just take us through what we're hearing tonight from uh, the president's first words as he landed.
Well, that's right. I mean, all the mood music on the record from the White House is that uh, Joe Biden will be even handed messages to both the UK and the EU to try and resolve their differences. But pick up a front, the front page of The Times tomorrow and it talks about how Joe Biden has issued a warning, a message to the UK to stop inflaming tensions over Northern Ireland and with Europe. Now, what The Times have got is a, a, a memo of a meeting that uh, Yale Lumpert, who is the the uh, United States Chargé d'Affaires in London, a meeting with Lord Frost, the Brexit minister, on the 3rd of June. And in this, it said it, it, that she implied that they implied in this meeting that the UK was uh, inflaming uh, tensions. It's described as a, a demarche. It's strongly uh, worded and talked about how that the UK should come to a negotiated settlement. Interestingly, it says the US would like to see the UK follow agricultural rules, EU agricultural rules. That would be the way of resolving this issue. The UK is very clear. We cannot follow EU rules. That's not Brexit. That means if you do that, uh, that you end up uh, under uh, the uh, European Court of Justice. Now, David Frost asked the EU for more pragmatism today, and the EU suggested that if Britain went it al uh, alone, um, then there would be some kind of sanctions, some kind of tariffs. Now, at this point, people sort of get out of bounds, start talking about a trade war. So what does a tariff or a sanction actually mean here, Nick? Well, the heart of Great Britain's relationship with the European Union, because obviously Northern Ireland is different, is zero tariffs and zero quotas. If the EU was to pick those apart, that would have serious consequences, tariffs, for the car industry and for the agricultural sector. But anything that the EU decides to do has to be proportionate and there's an arbitration mechanism. So something involving a row over health certificates on sausages travelling from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, you couldn't really then sort of uh, punitively uh, have a big impact on the whole of the Great Britain economy. But look, this Brexit row is playing out just on the eve of Boris Johnson taking to the world stage. A generation apart, standard bearers for different political outlooks two leaders heading for their first encounter in difficult circumstances. A seaside meeting, no doubt with plenty of smiles, but deep concerns in Washington over Northern Ireland and its future in the world of Brexit. Touching down and getting to the point post haste, a warning from Washington that the UK-EU impasse over Brexit could jeopardise the Good Friday Agreement. A diplomatic message for all. The United States still has what it takes to rally the world's democracies to solve the great problems of our time. But then this. Our concern runs very deep on the Northern Ireland issue. An unmistakable raising of the diplomatic eyebrow. Northern Ireland runs deep for this president. He is Irish American. He's proud of it. He constantly refers back to his heritage. He's also really proud of his work as a statesman, as a United States senator. He was one of the key backers of George Mitchell, who was the diplomat, who was a former member of Congress himself, who was charged by President Clinton with hammering out those accords. So there's something personal in it for him because he's Irish and because he's actually worked on it himself. The US intervention comes amid a standoff between London and Brussels over the Northern Ireland Protocol, a key part of Boris Johnson's Brexit deal to guarantee no hard border on the island of Ireland. Today, I can say we are at the crossroads in our relationship with the UK. Trust, which should be at the heart of every partnership, needs to be restored. Milder language from the UK, but definitely not yet friends. There weren't any breakthroughs, there aren't any breakdowns either, and we're going to carry on talking. Pressure for agreement ahead of a 30th of June deadline for the ending of grace periods designed to ease the impact of checks in the Irish Sea. At the heart of this row, where to place the EU's border with its recently departed member state? The EU's chief Brexit negotiator originally proposed checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland to avoid that hard border on the island of Ireland. And no UK Prime Minister could ever agree to it. 
no to that from Theresa May. Her backstop to be triggered in the event of no deal would have kept Northern Ireland almost wholly within the orbit of the EU, a bit like today. But Great Britain would have had a basic customs union with the EU, thereby avoiding checks on the Irish Sea. A new Prime Minister and perhaps a sense of déjà vu. Boris Johnson signed a deal involving checks on goods travelling from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, though they are lighter than the original EU idea. In meetings here in Downing Street after signing his Brexit deal with the EU, Boris Johnson was warned in minute and precise detail by the DUP leadership about the consequences of placing Northern Ireland in such a different relationship with the EU to the rest of the UK. No chilled meat, that's sausages, allowed to travel from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, he was warned. I'm told that with a wave of the arm, Boris Johnson dismissed their concerns, saying all will be fine. A leading DUP member warns of severe consequences. The EU are insisting on going well beyond what the protocol requires of uh, the UK government and is demanding things now which were never required in the first place. From Sinn Féin, little sympathy for a party which campaigned for Brexit and against Theresa May's proposal that would have avoided those Irish sea checks. We wouldn't be having these conversations if we didn't have Brexit. So protocol is here because of Brexit, a Brexit which the DUP helped to champion, helped to deliver, uh, dismissed every other version of Brexit. So what we're dealing with now is the reality that's been brought about uh, by the DUP in cahoots with the British government. A veteran Conservative advisor on Northern Ireland says the EU should be more flexible. It's clearly insane that a single packet of sausages destined for a Sainsbury's store in East Belfast has to undergo checks uh, for, for fear that it might illegally enter the EU single market when Sainsbury's doesn't have a single store in the EU. Hardly the season for a fireside chat, but a tete-a-tete, -tete, no doubt with some warmth, that may well set the mood for Britain's relations far and wide. Nick, what there? Well, we did ask the UK government for an interview tonight. They said no. We're joined now by Mick Mulvaney, former US Special Envoy to Northern Ireland under President Trump, Lord Dodds, former Deputy Leader of the DUP, and Claire Hanna, the MP for South Belfast from the SDLP, Labour's, as it were, sister party in Northern Ireland. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, Mick Mulvaney, if I can start with you, particularly on those comments that are just coming um, through to us, reported in The Times tomorrow, of these very strong words, um, a, a strong rebuke uh, about Boris Johnson for inflaming tensions over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Are you surprised to hear Joe Biden um, issuing such a, a strong rebuke, albeit through his, his, um, his staff and his ambassador? Uh, yes, I was. And thanks for having me, Emily. In fact, I, I've talked to some Democrats today on Capitol Hill, and they didn't indicate this was coming. So my guess is many American politicians on both sides of the political aisle will be a little bit surprised by this formal demarche. It's a very strange way uh, to start the conversation. In fact, it's sort of uh, is self-fulfilling when you're accusing Boris Johnson of inflaming the, the debate. One way to actually inflame the debate is to send a formal demarche. So instead of saying, look, can we sit down and talk this through, to send that level of, uh, of diplomatic communication as an opening salvo was, was, was uh, very surprising and I don't think very productive. Where do you think it will take things? Well, I hope it takes. I hope it gives them an opportunity to sort of step back and say, "Look, we, we should be able to work this through." Your introduction was well done. That the amount of commerce that moves from the island of Great Britain into Northern Ireland that has the risk of crossing into the EU across the, the border into the Republic of Ireland is so infinitesimally small. It's hard to believe that's really what we're talking about. Um, similarly, um, the, the things that Britain has done to sort of unilaterally change the protocol is the type of thing that sh should be able to get worked out. So I, I, again, I'm surprised that the U.S. seems to be, seems to be sort of inflaming things itself when level our heads is probably what we need right now. It's interesting that you call it inflaming. I, I guess it's sort of when Joe Biden promised, you know, America was back, isn't this what he means? He means he, he comes in and he says it like it is, and we know that he's got Irish roots, he cares very deeply about the Good Friday Agreement, he wants to see peace uh, preserved. 
uh, we all want to see peace preserved. We want to see the Good Friday Agreement, uh, the Belfast Agreement preserved. Uh, President Biden needs to remember that part of the Good Friday Agreement uh, respects the union of the, of the Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So, uh, yeah, when you talk about America being back, I thought that was sort of what Joe Biden didn't like about Donald Trump. Again, I think the two po the policies between the previous administration and this administration are pretty much aligned, which is that we wanted to have everybody sit down and walk through what should be uh, a negotiable type of thing. So to come in and sort of beat your chest and send a formal demarche, I'm not sure we've sent a formal demarche to Iran or China since Biden has been president. Maybe we have, and it hasn't got that much attention. So to start with that level of rhetoric, I think, is the thing that has a lot of us here scratching our heads. Let me just bring in um, Nigel Dodds, Lord Dodds. Do you, where do you think these negotiations can go? I mean, when you hear patience is wearing thin, do you think nothing's going to happen between the EU and the UK this week? Well, I, I, it, it's the hope of everybody that we can r arrive at sensible uh, negotiated outcomes, but it will require much greater uh, in uh, movement away from in tragedies than we've seen from the European Union uh, thus far. I mean, the European Union was prepared on the 29th of January to unilaterally invoke Article 16 of the protocol, which would have basically set aside provisions and imposed a hard border in the island of Ireland uh, for vaccines, of all things. So, you know, when people talk about good faith and trust, uh, it works both ways, and the EU have breached trust as far as the protocol is concerned for the people of Northern Ireland. To be fair, they rode back from that, and I think the space of, of three hours. Um, but yes, but the damage was done, Emily. I mean, the damage was done because it showed a willingness, and they also reserved the right to do it again. And, and when you think of the damage being done societally, environmentally, economically, the diversion of trade, uh, that's happening in Northern yeah. Ireland, which are all conditions for action by the British government. Those have been well met, let, given let me the enormous you, disruption to trade in Northern Ireland. You were there throughout the negotiations, um, Nigel Jones, for, for, for a lot of this time. Now, David Frost suggested today that this had all been more difficult than he'd anticipated, certainly than Boris Johnson had anticipated. Is your recollection that Boris Johnson just had no idea what this would entail, that he, he had no idea how this would turn out. Was that what, what you recall? Well, first of all, Theresa May's backstop, which people now seem to look back on fondly, did have a regulatory border down the RIC and did place Northern Ireland inside the EU Customs Union, albeit it tacked on some temporary rickety regime which would keep Britain temporarily aligned, but it wasn't part of the treaty. So, so that was no good. But, but you're right to point out that when the protocol was brought forward at the end of the negotiations in October 2019 by David Frost and Boris Johnson, we in the DUP warned in the House of Commons in private meetings, there were cabinet papers which illustrated in full detail the full implications and consequences of this protocol. So yes, there may be some areas where it has gone further than it should, but the basic fundamental problems of the protocol were well known when the British government signed up to it, unfortunately. Why do you think um, they did then? I mean, why well, do you think that was ignored? The, the, the reason why it was done, um, which they said uh, and have said since, is that they, they worried that Brexit wouldn't get done, that this would be something that needed to happen, but that when Britain had, the United Kingdom had full sovereignty, then the matter would be addressed. There's no doubt that the full consequences of this have taken people, uh, in, some people by surprise, in Whitehall, who didn't look at the detail very, very closely. And the fundamental point is this. If checks and infrastructure in the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic could destabilise the Good Friday Agreement and subsequent agreements and peace, likewise, checks and infrastructure between Northern Ireland and Great Britain will do exactly the same. And in order to ensure that we have stability and preserve the peace and political process, we must not have checks either north-south or east-west. That's you, the fundamental. Claire problem. Honey, you can see um, how this feels to, to the UK government, that the EU seems intractable and the UK just wants economic and territorial integrity, which was at the centre of Brexit. 
Well, I don't think it's credible to say that they didn't understand what was coming. It was clear to many of us well in advance of Brexit that there would be friction somewhere. That was what the project was always going to involve. But it is fair to say that while nobody loves the protocol, I think um, there is a gross distortion of the impact that it's having. It is causing frustrations for people, particularly for smaller businesses, and it has uh, annoyed people. But, but that is being elevated to some sort of Mad Max scenario where people are implying their empty shelves and, and, and mass disorder. And, and that really isn't the case. I mean, there, there's cl clearly um, a, a community that are very up upset about the concept of um, a different set of regulations uh, on, in Northern Ireland and in Britain. But the, the protocol is being used as a receptacle for decades of grievance uh, and frustration about a lack of uh, political uh, delivery. There are solutions there. I mean, um, a veterinary and SPS uh, deal even potentially with a sunset clause that would would mean it could go either when the UK figure out what they want to do with Brexit or indeed um, when some of the uh, infrastructure is in place for things like trusted trader schemes. But th that requires goodwill and it requires the UK, I suppose, to, to implement uh, what they've signed up to. To this point, this is really about keeping your word and it's about a rules-based order. Claire, I'm going to let you press the little sign that says we still want to keep you. There you go. Um, we've, we've got you back. I, I do have to remind you, though, that just weeks ago, we were seeing all kinds of rioting and unrest on the streets of Belfast. To call it a kind of political hyperbole is to ignore the reality, isn't it? No, it's not. And, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not denying the frustration and, and the sense of hurt um, that because the SDLP has said for many years that borders have symbolic value. But even if you look at the placards and those demonstrations, they talk about um, concerns about policing. Some people are referencing economic dislocation. The same young man who made headlines a few weeks ago um, by talking about not ruling out violence at a parliamentary select committee was interviewed by the BBC after those riots saying, I don't really know what the protocol is, but my political leaders keep telling me I'm losing. And right. it is indeed th those leaders who have brought us to this point by shutting off and voting against well, let me all ask, possible alternatives to Brexit. As an outsider, as it were, Mick Mulvaney, what would be your message? What would you say to Nigel Dodds tonight or any other Northern Irish politician who, who says it, it's ridiculous that you can't get sausages from one side of Britain uh, to, to the rest of the UK without filling out a form? Yeah, uh, briefly, the message to the EU would be, let's calm down. This is not that big a deal. The flow of trade should not be a threat to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. For the folks who live on the island of Ireland, Let's, or within the UK government, I'm sorry, let's, let's not do things unilaterally. Let's sit down and talk about that. Most importantly, to my own government, can we please get some ambassadors in place? Can we please put a special envoy in place? And can we please understand that when we are the ones who are stirring things up and inflaming it, just it, it is not going to help. Would you um, get rid of the protocol? Uh, no, it's not my place. The protocol was agreed to between the UK and the EU. Again, it's that we are not even signatories to the Good Friday mm -hmm. Agreement. We are interested, very interested third parties who want to see this part of the world that so many of us are from succeed. There are tremendous opportunities available to Northern Ireland uh, if this all goes well, be the only place in the world that will have full access to the UK market and, and to the EU market. The potentials here are great. Let's not lose sight of that. So your fortunes, Nigel Dodds, at the moment uh, are with your new leader, Edwin Poots. This is the man your party has tasked with getting you out of this. Can he? Well, we, it remains to be seen. Uh, I mean, the fact of the matter is that we now have a situation in Northern Ireland where we have taxation without representation, a principle that would be very familiar to, to Mick, where laws will be made for Northern Ireland in Brussels without any input from any elected representative, either at Stormont in Belfast or in Westminster in London. Uh, and, you know, only the other day, Marks and Spencer said that it was going to cost them £30 million pounds extra a year because of the protocol. A, a, a freight pallet normally costing £100 pounds is extra cost 50 to £350 pounds per freight pallet. That was the information given to us today to the House of Lords uh, Select Committee on the protocol of which I'm a member. Um, these are real problems, real uh, issues. So there's the trade problems that need to be sorted out, but there's also the democratic deficit, the constitutional situation whereby Northern Ireland is now placed under EU rules and the European Court of Justice, and there's no say or vote or, or rule for any elected representative, and that is, in the 21st century, unconscionable.
Thank you all very much. Thanks for joining us this evening. Appreciate it.